So, warm welcome to the 14th lecture on the subject of discrete time signal processing and its applications. This lecture will continue with where we left in the previous lecture, namely on the properties of the Z transform. We had introduced the Z transform in the previous lecture and we had started looking at some of its properties. I would like to recall a couple of points from the previous lecture before we proceed to say more about the Z transform and its properties. We had looked at the expression for the Z transform. Let us recapitulate that. So, if you have a sequence x n, then we said its Z transform is given by summation over all n all integer n I mean x n z raise the power minus n. And this always has a region of convergence. Or R O C as it is often called for short. Now, the region of convergence is always a region between two concentric circles with the circles centered at the origin. And we said that one of the concentric circles could possibly have radius 0 and the other one could possibly have radius infinity. right? So, 0 and infinity are also possible radii. It was also a point that needed to be addressed to look at whether the boundaries are included in the region of convergence. Right, the boundaries may or may not be included and that needs to be checked in each case individually. One guideline is if there is a singularity on the boundary, a point where that quantity diverges, then of course, that boundary cannot be included in the region of convergence. Right? So, these are about the Z transform in general and its definition and its contents. You know, a Z transform al always has an expression with a region of convergence. Yes, there is a question. So, we said that z is equal to r into relation j omega. Yes. Does, does r have any physical significance? Oh, so that is a good question. It says, you know, we had said, all right, so let us come to that. We had said that z is of the form r e raise the power j omega. So, the question is, omega seems to have a physical significance. And that physical significance is the angular normalized angular frequency, is not it? However, the question is does R have a physical significance? R does indeed have a physical significance. There are two ways of understanding R. One way is, you know, a formal way. That is, it is the rate at which the exponential should multiply that sequence so as to bring the Z transform into convergence. That is a formal way of understanding R, right. So, if you look at it, x z is equal to summation over all n n from minus to plus infinity x n and now let us write this in terms of r and omega. So, e raise the power minus j omega n and r raise the power minus n. So, r is the exponential parameter in a way, exponential or curtailing parameter if you may call it that. Essentially, it, in, it ensures that the sequence converges on multiplication by this exponential. So, r is in some sense the rate at which the exponential must you know grow to capture the sequence or another way of looking at it is r to the power minus n is the exponential that must capture the sequence to bring it into convergence. Right? That is the way to understand it. If we speak informal language, if we recall the analogy of the tiger that I gave last time, r is the size or the strength of the cage that you need to encapsulate the tiger. 
right. So, you have this sequence which refuses to converge, which you cannot train, for whom you cannot find a frequency response. So, you need R to capture it, to tame it, so that a frequency response exists. That is the physical significance of R, that is a good question. Any other questions from the previous lecture? Yes, there is a question, yes. Okay. Okay, so, so the question is, can we view the Z transform as the discrete time Fourier transform of a sequence? Can you think of the Z transform as indicating the frequency content of some other sequence? Yes, indeed, of course. If you look at it, in its region of convergence, x z, which is summation n going from minus to plus infinity x n r raise to the power minus n times e raise to the power minus j omega n is the d t f t of x n r raise to the power minus n. So, in fact, it is the discrete time Fourier transform or in other words, it indicates the frequency content in a suitably weighted sequence x n or x n weighted by an exponential. The exponential should strongly or it should be strong enough, the exponential should be quick enough to capture the growth of x n, so that this discrete time Fourier transform converges. So, in a way that z transform on any particular circle in the region of convergence, take, take any circle centered at the origin lying entirely in the region of convergence on that circle, the z transform is essentially the sequence is the, is the discrete time Fourier transform of the sequence given by x n multiplied by r raised to power minus n, where r is the radius of that circle. That is the way to understand. Yes. Any other questions? Any other question before we proceed? Yes, no other questions, none at all. All right. So, then we will proceed to look at a few more properties of the z transform. Now, we had seen some properties. We had seen that the z transform is linear. We had seen that it is linear, linear as an operator. Secondly, we had seen that the z transform has a property of delay, the delay property or the shift property, is not it? That is if you shift the sequence by d, then the z transform gets multiplied by my z to the power minus d. Of course, we had talked about the region of convergence. We also saw what happens when we differentiate. This was what we were looking at last time. So, we saw that if you differentiated the z transform, right. So, if you have d x z d z, and multiply this by minus z. It is the z transform of n times x n. That is interesting. And we also looked at the region of convergence. In each case, we had seen the region of convergence, right. We saw that, you know, normally a z transform is analytic in its region of convergence. In fact, we are going to restrict ourselves to that class of z transforms. So, the same region of convergence would hold for this this derivative, save for the boundaries. The boundaries need to be checked, right. Now, we look at a very important property of the z transform, namely the property of convolution. That is the real, you know, value of the z transform. So, what happens when we convolve two sequences? So, let x n have a z transform x z with the region of convergence R x and let h n have a z transform h z with the region of convergence R h. We ask what is the z transform of the convolution of x with h. Now, you see the principle that we use to arrive at the answer is very similar to what we did in the case of the discrete time Fourier transform. There is no fundamental difference. The only thing is that we have to remember that z must lie, you see in principle, here let us 
take a z to lie in the region of convergence of both, namely the intersection of the regions of convergence. Now, there are tricky issues here. What happens if the intersection is null? Can you still, still convolve? Well, we would not answer these questions now. They are tricky ones, but for the moment, let us take a situation where there is a non null intersection of the region of convergence and let us pick a z from that intersection of the regions of convergence of r and r x and r h. So, let us say for the moment, I am saying for the moment, assume that r x intersection r h is not null, is not empty. Pick a z from that intersection and use that z in the discussion that follows or use any of those z's in the discussion that follows. Now, let us look at the z transform. Let us call x convolved with h, let us call it y. So, of course, we need to find out the z transform of y. So, y z is of course, summation n going from minus to plus infinity, y n z raised to power minus n. And we have picked a z, z chosen suitably, chosen in r x intersection r h, as we have said. Now, expand y n. So, you have y n is summation over all k integer x k h n minus k, whereupon we have y z is given by summation n over all integer summation k over all the integers x k h n minus k times z raised to the power minus n. And of course, we use the same strategy as before. We put n minus k equal to another variable m. And now, instead of n and k, we go to k and m. So, of course, k is as it is, k runs over. You see, k and n independently run over all the integers. So, for a fixed k, n runs over all the integers. Now, if n and k independently run over all the integers, then for a fixed k, m would also run over all the integers independent of k. right? And therefore, we could rewrite this summation here as summation k over all the integers, summation m over all the integers and we have x k h m and m is of course, k plus m. That becomes summation of I am not writing the limits every time, they are understood h m z raise the power minus k z raise the power minus m. And now, we notice something very interesting. There are terms that depend only on k, there are terms that depend only on m. So, we can act summation m on the terms that depend only on m and that leaves us with, so you see, I mean what I am saying is, we could take this term and this term and operate the summation on m on them. That gives us a quantity independent of k. So, that leads us to summation k over all the integers x k z raise the power minus k in bracket summation over all m h m z raise the power minus m. And note that this is essentially h z and h z is of course, independent of k. So, I can draw h z outside the summation because it is independent of k. 
and that leaves me with this, but then this happens to be x z. And therefore, we have a product of h z and x z. That is very interesting. So, y z is clearly x z h z. So, in other words, this is a very important theorem. It says that convolution in the natural domain leads to multiplication in the z domain. This is not surprising, because in particular, if the unit circle or mod z equal to 1 or r equal to 1 is included in the regions of convergence of both or at least definitely of y z, then you would find that it this boils down to the specific property of the discrete time Fourier transform. Namely, when I convolve two sequences, if each of them has a discrete time Fourier transform, their convolution would also have a discrete time Fourier transform given by the product of these. Now, you see, we can also give this an interpretation. What we are saying is that, if you have a linear shift invariant system, with impulse response h n, and if you have a sequence x n, we are saying that if you, you see, as such x n and h n may not have discrete time Fourier transforms. But again, you could encapsulate these tigers in a cage, multiply them by suitable exponentials. So, you could multiply x n, multiply each of x n and h n by a suitable r raised to the power minus n. And now, you can use the property of the discrete time Fourier transform. So, you could now treat x, you see the beauty is that now, the same LSI system, but now the impulse response should be viewed as h n r raised to the power minus n. And here we have x n r raised to the power minus n given as the input. The beauty is that you would get y, instead of y n, you would get y n r raised to the power minus n. Or in other words, if you took the d t f t of this, d t f t of x n r raise the power minus n multiplied by d t f t of h n r raise the power minus n is equal to d t f t of y n r raise the power minus n. So, you use the same property, what we are saying is you use the same property of the discrete time Fourier transform, but on a suitably treated or on a suitably tamed sequence or suitably tamed input and impulse response, tamed by r raise to the power minus n. That is what we are saying effectively. Of course, in some cases, you may in fact view this not as a taming, but also as a license. So, for example, you know if you look at it, suppose we take x n equal to half raise the power of n u n and h n equal to one third raise the power of n u n. We can easily obtain their z transforms. 
it is very easy to see that x z is 1 by 1 minus half z inverse with mod z greater than half. And similarly, h z is 1 by 1 minus 1 third z inverse with mod z greater than 1 third. Very easy to see. So, of course, if you take the convolution, if you happen, if this h n happens to be the impulse response, and of course, you note that an LSI system with this impulse response h n would be stable, because this sequence is easily seen to be absolutely summable. In fact, you can find its absolute sum. But that apart, the sequence gives us a stable LSI system for the impulse response, and x convolved with h, which is y, has the z transform y z given by x z h z, which is 1 by 1 minus half z inverse into 1 minus 1 third z inverse. And of course, now the region of convergence is indeed the intersection of the two regions of convergence. So, mod z must be greater than half, mod z must be greater than 1 third. So, in total mod z must be greater than half, because that is the intersection. Now, mod z greater than half is like a license. I told you, you know, we have been talking about encapsulating or taming the sequence, but here mod z needs only to be greater than half. You can take, for example, mod z equal to 3 fourths. In fact, you can take z equal to 3 fourths if you like. Now, 3 fourths raised to the power minus n is actually an exponentially growing sequence it is 4 by 3 raised to the power of n. So, in a way you are saying even if you multiply x n and h n by an exponentially growing sequence and take their discrete time Fourier transforms, yet you could apply the property that we did a couple of points a couple of minutes ago. What I meant was you know here we had x n r raised to the power minus n applied to h n r raised to the power minus n giving you y n r raised to the power minus n. So, here r could be a quantity less than 1, r could be 3 by 4 in this example, which means it is actually an exponentially growing sequence. So, there is a license also, there is a bit of a license to allow the sequence to grow, but still you can encapsulate, you can allow it to apply the discrete time Fourier transform problem. Of course, this is because the sequence itself is exponentially, both of the sequences are exponentially decaying. So, you know if the exponential growth is slower than this decay, then on and on this leads to a decay and therefore, you can have some license that is what we are saying in effect. Mm -hmm.